with a presentation. Um, so yeah, enjoy the event and, and again, uh, thanks for joining. Share. Okay, here we go. I think the project first one. That's it. Fernando, you are showing the next. Okay. Okay, this uh, will be recorded anyway. So if you are not able to assist right now, you can watch it later on. In today's talk, we will be talking about uh, different applications of uh, big data in these COVID times. And uh, we are Alicia, Camila, Hector, and Fernando speaking. We will introduce ourselves in a few seconds. And we work for Guanam. The agenda for this talk will be first, our main topic, which is the COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness, uh, big data work. And then uh, we will talk about uh, the case for tracking mobility through graphs and natural uh, language processing for medical papers. A few words about us. Guanam is a Uruguayan based company with offices in other countries in Latin America, uh, three in Brazil, one in Chile, one in Mexico, and one in the US. Uh, we, are, we have uh, more than 40 years of experience, over 400 consultants. Um, actually, the ones here belong to data and analytics, Camila, Hector, Alicia, and myself. And I am the guy in, in Barcelona. They are right now uh, speaking from the warm place in Uruguay. In this business unit, we are over 70 people specializing in, in different areas uh, within uh, data and analytics, ranging from traditional business intelligence through uh, big data and artificial intelligence. So this is what we do in our uh, data and analytics team. We take into account traditional analytics evolving uh, uh, to human judgment. And for that, we propose decision support tools, and then we evolve to decision automation. So the, the natural path that we propose for the organization uh, ranges from descriptive analytics through diagnostic, predictive, prescriptive, and cognitive or artificial intelligence, which we will be talking about in this, this talk. Okay, so let's uh, briefly introduce ourselves. Alicia. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Alicia Cabrera from Uruguay. I'm pleased to be here. I am a system engineer, a part of the data and analytics team in Quantum. And I was lucky to participate in the big data project about analysis for COVID vaccine effectiveness, which has been very challenging. Um, and next, Fernando will expand on it. We hope you find it interest, interesting. And here we are for any questions. Thank you. I'm Camila. I also work in data analytics in Quantum, and I'm the data scientist of the team. So as the only non-engineer, I'm gonna be talking today, not about how, how things are in reality, uh, or, um, so only about how we can model them and approach them with statistics. Last but not least, my name is Hector. I'm a system engineer. Uh, with more than 11 years or so working with data. Uh, presently, I finished my master degree in data science and my main 
in interest are machine learning focus on social network analysis, uh, geospatial analysis, and, and natural language processing. Thank you, Hector. And finally, I'm Fernando, also a computer engineer and with a master's degree in bioinformatics. And I lead the big data practice, practice uh, in uh, quantum data and analytics. Okay, let's go to our main topic, the COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness. So, uh, first of all, let me say a few words about the, the, the context uh, of, of this talk, because this is about uh, tracking COVID uh, vaccine effectiveness in Uruguay, our country. Uh, with a population of about three and a half million people. Uh, we will show uh, how we helped in, in this study, but of course, uh, this talk is not about uh, conclusions or actual numbers uh, for the sake of uh, confidentiality. But we will share uh, some news that are publicly available and that you can check by yourselves. Um, in Uruguay, sadly, we had a, a, a record in uh, mortality ratio. I think this was in uh, March or April. Uh, fortunately, the situation reverted right now. And the, thanks to a very good vaccination campaign, uh, now COVID is, is still there, of course, but the, the ratios are very, very good. Okay, uh, let's talk about the concept of effectiveness. It's easier to say this in Spanish because we do have different words for uh, uh, efectividad. Let me show you. How to say this in English is a challenge because in Spanish we have three words, but in English we have two for different concepts. Because uh, when we say effective at the first place, from an engineering point of view, uh, we say that something solves the problem. And when we talk about efficiency in, in Spanish, eficiencia, it means that uh, it solves the problem, but it also makes a reasonable use of resources like time and money. But we have a third vision, which is in English, again, effectiveness, let's say medical effectiveness, and in Spanish, effectividad. This means how, what happens when the wheel meets the road? What happens when uh, uh, you measure this in the actual field, not only in the laboratory with the expected uh, success ratios? This is the sense of our research, okay? Okay, so uh, what was the original uh, need? The, our, our request came originally from uh, the Uruguayan government. Uh, Salud UI is the National Electronic Agency for, for Healthcare. And uh, AGESIC, which is the government office for uh, information and communications. So, uh, we wanted, we were requested to study uh, vaccine effectiveness. We started with uh, uh, Sinovac vaccine in Uruguay, and then we incorporated AstraZeneca and Pfizer. So uh, by that time, under a quite high pressure, as I said before, this was April, uh, we wanted to know how good the vaccine was. So we started effectiveness and also coverage. And this means uh, how far uh, within the population we were uh, covering. Uh, did everyone get the, the proper doses? And also the statistics analysis on this. Our solution was threefold. At the first place, we helped to build a data lake 
This is the big repository for receiving all the information from many different sources, integrate and curate the data and enable further analysis. Also dashboards for the end users summarizing this uh, information analytics and cubes for power users that uh, would like to uh, perform their own queries or investigations. The big benefits of uh, this uh, approach was a, a scalable platform capable of, of supporting uh, dynamic requirements. Requirements were constantly evolving, changing as, as time uh, was passing by. Um, we were able to deliver a dashboard for online analysis of uh, vaccine effectiveness and also to provide information for decision making, for instance, about campaigns. So you see, uh, the hard times in Uruguay were around April, as I said, with a second peak in June. And the yellow dots here reflect main events in our project. In, in May, we were releasing the first effectiveness, effectiveness report. Um, actually, it was the government, the health department, releasing this report. We were contributing with numbers, with actual figures of what was going on in terms of coverage and effectiveness. Of course, uh, we were able to, to get first coverage and after that effectiveness, because effectiveness uh, means that you need to measure how well the, the vaccine is performing in the field, uh, preventing infections, preventing uh, hospitalizations and preventing deaths. Okay, so you need time to speak about effectiveness. Then we have uh, uh, other effectiveness uh, reports. And Fernando, then, sorry. Yes. Uh, these three reports uh, was uh, were for public purpose. No, they were mm -hmm. shown to the uh, este, uh, via Twitter to all of us. Mm -hmm. No. Yes. You could, thanks, Alicia. You could find uh, these reports. You can find these reports in, in press. So this is public uh, information. Okay. What is not public is what, what's anonymized in the data lake and uh, which you use to, to make the calculations. So these uh, reports, these summaries are uh, available. And um, then uh, we we made a special analysis uh, about different health groups with special requirements. Then we made a study on phased effectiveness. We will talk about this later. And currently we are working on the booster dose uh, in Uruguay. Uh, people are getting the third dose already from some time ago. Okay, some references. Here we we have a couple of links uh, about news regarding the vac vaccination uh, process and the efficiency, I should say, effectiveness. And, and you see the, the first uh, figures. These figures are constantly evolving. So you will see how you, you can check how currently the, uh, the whole campaign is effective in terms of, as I said, uh, hospitalization to death, okay? So take this number as a baseline because this actually improved, okay? Another important uh, mention is that we have uh, the visit from the CDC, from the, the US, which is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, it's uh, a group that uh, visited uh, our project from the from the US, and they they were they were quite uh, impressed with with the, with the work. Let's talk about issues. Every project has issues, right? And we were not the exception. Um, we had to 
deliver on time um, and believe me it was a hard time because of the pressure because as i said in uruguay uh, we were having a this nasty record of uh, mortality ratio so we were urged to to make something useful in in a few weeks typically you know if you are in the Spark group, that making a data lake can take months at least. And for us, this was weeks. So we do, we did what we could in these uh, weeks in order to deliver on time and trustable data coming from different sources. And we had to inject uh, resources quickly into the project because the, the time was so the time window was so stretched. Also, the metrics were uh, constantly changing because they, it was a um, it was an, a, a constant improvement. Improvement. Um, we started with basic metrics, but then we had to adjust because data behaved different from the expectations, and then we had to to put a focus on, on epochs because it is not the same what you measure at the beginning of the pandemic and right now. So you need to, uh, you need to take in, into account uh, people with uh, different needs, uh, people get older, you have uh, you had some groups of adult people uh, 10 months ago and people now is older. So the groups changed, okay? A few words about uh, our infrastructure. The, the core of the data leak is around Spark. Spark stores, stores data in uh, Hadoop. We also have uh, HDFS and Hive. And we uh, worked with PySpark through notebooks. For delivery of the results, we used uh, this very nice open source dashboard tool, Superset. And we delivered cubes, cubes to power users using Pentaho and Saiku. We worked with two environments, one for pre-production and one for production. And this was critical because we were not all seeing, not also uh, testing our development, but also testing data, because we want we needed to make very sure because because this is very critical information that different sources uh, matched, that, that they were not uh, like contradiction. This is a quick view of the operational schema. We received information from external sources and uh, this was received anonymized in the HDFS inbox. From there, we perform extract and load and then transform using Spark, which was the main part of the, of the data lake. And from then, at the beginning, we used Hive in order to expose results. As you may already know, Hive is very good at throughput, but not so good when it comes to latency. So we introduced Postgres, a relational database, uh, for storing the results that would be finally displayed by Superset. And similarly, we, we made another database for quickly accessing the indicators for the cubes that were served through Pentaho. In short, the process had this uh, six steps. At first, we ingested data, then we had to uh, refine or curate uh, discard data. Um, we needed to be aware rather quickly that uh, information was not very, very clean because this was uh, uh, set up all, all in a hurry and the, the campaign was running so fast that maybe there was a, a daily en data entry error, but finally we could, we could cope with that. Then we generated uh, analytics 
and explore the results uh, internally. We validated the results and the data, and then we published to our production environment with the dashboards and the cubes. No questions so far? Okay. Well, Kami, gonna... your turn. Now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about the analysis we made um, to uh, release the information to the public of vaccine uh, effectiveness. It was important to have a measure of the margin of error. We, we couldn't say it's just a number because we were aware that the circumstances were very unpredictable and it, it wasn't the, the most recommendable way to do it. So what uh, we implement was uh, we needed to calculate the, the confidence intervals, which were um, a, a representative in the measure how much a, a particular statistic uh, calculated over a sample. It, it gives us the upper and lower bound of some statistic with a level of uncertainty, with a level of certainty. That level of certainty is called the confidence level. In statistics, usually a 95% confidence level is the more, it's, we say that it's as acceptable and it's significant. But the confidence level, for it, it represents that if you repeat the experiment over and over again, like a hundred times, it's 95% of those times the statistics will uh, be inside of the confidence interval that you are actually uh, saying. So the vaccine efficiency is a certain percentage, let's say 60%, but uh, we said that we have a margin between 40% and 70%. And inside those bounds, it will fall most of the time. So, yeah. So for that, for that we had um, actually to calculate the confidence interval. We have um, several um, already developed software that were used in epidem epidemiology. <laughs> Sorry, epidemiology. but epidemiology. actually the challenge, yeah, <laughs> it's a very hard one to say. But the challenge was to integrate that to our solutions. So, uh, for instance, Epidat. It's uh, epidemiological analysis of tabulated data. It's a software open source software developed uh, by the Pan American Health Organization and the Consejería Junta de Galicia. That is, it actually provides a medical personnel with a, a type of table that you can enter your data and it calculates your confidence interval. And similarly, OpenEPI, it's the same, but developed by a US, um, a US university in collaboration with CDC, actually. And well, first we went to, to search for the, form, the formulas that they used, that was Bayer and Taylor method, and we implement that inside a Jupyter notebook. But the main problem of that approach was that when we had a small number of cases, for instance, we calculated that weekly. And as the number of cases or number of deaths actually were smaller, uh, our confidence interval uh, was, is going to be higher because uh, we have a, a lot of, it's a problem of a small sample that all statistics have. So actually the, the next step for us was trying to, instead of working with a formula, trying to model the reality so that we could estimate those uh, times where the number of observations of the data wasn't, the samples were uh, a little small. So we already had the estimates for those times. And for that, um, ne next slide, please, Fer. Uh, what we did was implement um, a, a model first, a model of regression, um, which what was, was the challenge with that? Well, which type of model we should use? Uh, we started uh, trying to see if we could use a negative binomial model, which was implemented by the Israel in measuring of vaccine efficiency effectiveness, sorry. 
and comparing the results with Poisson regression, which are both uh, models for regressing the number of cases. It's, it tries to count data. So we use as regression variables factors such as age group, type of vaccine, and dosage. So we could say we had an estimate of vaccine effic efficiency by week and by all the factors. So we could see if they impact differently in certain age groups or by vaccine, obviously. And the, those results were calculated in the three main events, um, number of cases, number of people in the ICU, and number of deaths. And well, th those models were the ones that were implemented and actually informs in the first, uh, in the reports that uh, Fer mentioned a, a while ago. So that those are the ones that were uh, told to the population. Uh, uh, an interesting thing that was that with, with the development of the course of the disease, actually, well, not disease, I don't know, uh, the pandemic, let's say, <laughs> uh, actually we had like uh, a reduction of cases, luckily, but those models also started to uh, have their problems due to small samples. And other models that we try to implement or try to um, do to analyze the situation uh, was a time series approach with neural networks and also um, a model to try to say when was the, the point in time with, where we reach uh, the, the so-called um, her, herd immunity that were so discussed in the media. <laughs> and well, that was a, a bit of the analytics we, we did. So thank you. And I, I let Alicia show you a, a little bit about what the end users uh, saw in our solution. Yes, and let me point out uh, now that Cam Cami mentioned the herd immunity. This is a, a concept that was very, very discussed and there is not a final agreement on, on, on that. Uh, we were also working with different uh, information of different uh, variants and you know that uh, the, this virus like others is constantly mutating so it's difficult to, to make a hypothesis on predicting this um, herd uh, immunity because the, co the conditions change and the virus changes also okay uh, we have been talking too much, so let's show a few pictures. Shall I, Alicia, or do you want? Okay. So this is this one is quite clear. You see, uh, the orange line is about the coverage counting two doses. Okay, and you can see in the green line the infection ratio is almost uh, symmetrical. You see how, how the, the coverage was very probably uh, uh, working uh, good uh, in order to cut down the infection ratio. This shows uh, how how well we were doing with uh, coverage in different regions within the country and separated by, by doses. As, as you can see at this point, the, the dominating condition was two doses. This is also an interesting one because it was about how well we were doing uh, coverage within the, the country. So. Uh, joining different sources, we we identified uh, different uh, villages, cities, towns, which had uh, different uh, vaccinating uh, coverage, and this could be useful in order to plan campaigns, for instance. And this is not—I know—is not the most. Uh, 
beautiful slide, but it shows the different vaccines and the actual effectiveness measured on adults. Well, this is about the infection ratio in different regions within the country. And that's it. That's it about the, the main part of our presentation. I don't know if you have any questions. If not, we will move forward with Hector. So far, so good. It seems like that. So I'm going to start. So, okay, we'll talk a, a little about some solutions for case tracking using networks or graph. I'm not talking about networks as Camila said, neural networks and neither graphs as pie chart graphs or the ugliest graphs that the that Fernando show, <laughs> but I'm talking about graphs as a set of nodes and, or points and edges. So I think that graphs are, are cool uh, structures to model the reality in a more accurate uh, way that maybe uh, relational tables can, can show us. So please, uh, I think that we all see and we all live the situation that the coronavirus created an unprecedented lockdown in many countries, for not say all countries. And obviously, this caused a um, um, huge uh, economic and social impact. So I, um, in, in the private sector, uh, there was a lot of attempts uh, using electronic devices, mostly smartphones, to stop the, the, the spread of the COVID-19. Uh, and and the, the government, or, or, or our idea is to, to think an intelligent way to, to implement the, the social distancing because most of the attempts try to gather in information about infected people and healthy people and try to avoid contact between them. Uh, so we, we, we try to think in, in a way to, to maximize for, for saying uh, in a way social distancing and minimize the impact on the on the economy and uh, to do that we use uh, networks and, and graphs so for give you a little context about how the idea was uh, incubated uh, let's talk uh, very quickly about some projects that we work, uh, that we implemented in Quantum using graphs in a lot of industries. So the first one uh, is in the insurance industry. The objective here was to detect uh, fraud in uh, vehicle claims and car crashes and insurance policies and these kind of things. The second one is a very, please, Fernando. It's very cool because it's using in, in public security for crime investigation. So it's very cool because you can see all the networks of crimes and who participated and phone calls and things like that. The third one. It's very similar to what we do for coronavirus and it's for epidemiology. I, I think that I will, I am fluent than Camila. <laughs> Sorry, Camila. Uh, but uh, we use it in cows. Here in Uruguay, uh, we have more cows than humans. So we love cows <laughs> and we have traceability for the cows because all have a air ring and you can see maybe the lots of cows when they 
go together to a farm or something like that. And if one is sick, maybe uh, we can see how to, to try to stop a, a pandemic with the cows. And this was a work uh, with the Minnesota University and was cool. So uh, to recapitulate, uh, the graphs, tools or solutions allows you to, to explore graphs and you can do a lot of things. The, the most useful, useful is what you see in these slides that uh, there are different visualizations that try to respond the, the typical questions like what, who, when, where, and these kind of things. You can see the, the graph as a network or maybe as a timeline or ubicated in locations and see information in a spatial way. You can do visual queries that it's great for not technical people. And uh, now I another cool thing that you can do with graphs is uh, social network analytics. So please, Fernando. Uh, social network analytics is very useful for a lot of things. Uh, I'm going to, to go a little deeper talking about uh, centrality measures, but you can quantify with this uh, which nodes are at risk, uh, maybe identify key players or uh, super broadcasters and things like that. Uh, you can do models for anticipating the, the, the spread of coronavirus or things like that. So go ahead. I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the most common centrality measures, but you have many, many, many. I'm going to talk about four. The first one is the degree, and it tries to measure how connected is uh, each entity. It's the most easy one because you only have to count the, the links of that entity. It's like, it's to show which person have more friends, to, to say in, in some way. And it's, it's a good measure to identify powerful people because of their relationships, uh, like maybe in a social network like Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or things like that. The graph could be directed or not directed, but it's the same. The second one is closeness. The, this one measures the proximity of an entity to other entities in the network. The, the most close person is the one who can achieve the other ones in the minimum champs or, or, or steps. And it's a good way to detect nodes that can efficiently uh, spread information or a virus <laughs> through, a, through the graph. The next one is uh, betweenness, that is something like intermediation or something like that, that measures the, the number of shortest paths or, or that pass through each entity. It's like a hub. You always need to pass uh, to this entity to go to one side of the graph to another side. And sometimes it's more, it's very important because uh, sometimes this person acts like an intermediate with some groups of the graph. So a lot of information must always pass through these people. And the last one is a vector that 
it's very common because it's very similar to the page rank algorithm. It tries to measure uh, how well connected are you and, and, and also how the people with you are connected. So uh, the, the intuition behind this is that maybe it's better having a few friends but very powerful friends and can give you more status than having many less powerful friends. I don't know if I was clear but okay. Another algorithm very cool with graphs are, are the pathfinder. The paths are essential for any graph analysis. Finding the shortest path is maybe the most common task performed with graph and is useful for many of the centrality measures that uh, I talked. Next one is uh, very important concept in, in graph theory because you can do very sophisticated analysis with, with that. For example, uh, fi finding communities. And, and this is because in real life, most networks uh, shows like subgraphs in, in, in this are like mini fractal graphs and, and are more or less independent graphs. So sometimes it's more important to analyze the subgraphs because many properties that if, if you see these properties in the average whole graph are very different than the properties that you can see in the subcommunities and sometimes uh, it's it gives you very a lot of insights and, and for example it's, it's useful to in social networks to find uh, strongly connected groups and, and it's very common that people that is very connected have similar preferences so you can suggest a product or, or something like that but okay let's talk about how we use some of these techniques in Uruguay to fight the COVID the successful Uruguayan case was the headline of a lot of international press and it has lots of uh, reasons one some of the they uh, Fernando said to you but it's the, the low population density the speed that the government took and adopt measures but one very important one key point was the contact tracing this allowed to know the magnitude of the transmission chains and to stop very quickly when we we have a, a possible outbreak and these things like uh, graves that you see in, in the picture are outbreaks and we have a lot of contact tracing people that made lots of calls to to know maybe with who you you visit and, and things like that to to get the the close people so let's talk about how we can model a graph to give a recommendation system to know which are the best uh, isolation measures to take. We can start with a very simple graph composed with uh, nodes that are people and yes, model the contacts between people. So you, you can then uh, start with some attributes or, or properties for the nodes with the 
probability of being infected that should be one in the case that you did a, a test and the test was positive or maybe some value near to one if you were in a red zone or something like that. And another property could be the probability of being vulnerable. For example, if you are a very old person or maybe if you have certain pathologies. You have the, the probability of being in contact that uh, you can have a little bit complex graph adding another kind of nodes, for example, uh, places like schools, bar, restaurant, theater, uh, workplace, and things like that. And you will have the, the cost of closing some of these utilities and a reduction factor that say to you, if you close Quanam, the probability of being in contact for me and Camila reduces to zero or something like to zero. So the, the risk of a facility is the weighted sum of the risk of being in contact with these people and the risk of a person in some way is also the way the sum of the time that this person spent in the facilities that he or she visit. So it's, you see that it's something similar to page rank another time. And uh, Hector, in this case, um, Fernando is out of the model, no? Because he is in Barcelona. <laughs> yes. In, in this case, the, the reduction factor uh, is useless because it doesn't affect the, the probability for me and Fernando of being in contact. <laughs> But fortunately, yes. we don't have any variant that can uh, uh, infect through the internet yet. <laughs> So uh, as you can imagine, with this approach, you can build an, an objective function to minimize with some restriction. The, the, the goal is to reduce the, the spread of the virus, but keeping the cost at minimum. And you can play with some parameters, like for example, a budget, and you have to keep the cost under the budget or maybe uh, you want to maximize the, the, the number of people connected in the resulting graph or avoid large groups uh, made with vulnerable people or avoid graph with mixed healthy and, and, and sick people. But this is the, the idea. We can't put this in production because of complexities with privacy and user data. But what Uruguay re-implements was coronavirus UI with exposure alerts that the, the cell exchange codes uh, for Bluetooth and register the codes. And if some person that you have been in contact for uh, more than 15 minutes and less than two meters, you have an alert that you would be infected. And another cool applications and use cases of machine learning to fight against coronavirus are two uh, user computer vision to detect a face mask or critical factors in X-ray pictures and the one picture that is in the middle, it's to detect coronavirus from the sound of the call. So I think that it's very interesting. And we have a lot of literature uh, that explains the use of graphs uh, or data science in general uh, to fight against uh, the, the virus, but uh, let's Fernando talk about how to use natural language processing to parse lots of 
documents. So, Fernando. Okay, thanks. I don't know if there are any questions. I think they are not, so we will move forward. So the final part of uh, our talk is about this work on uh, processing medical papers and trying to extract, extract knowledge from that. Uh, this talk is based on, on this paper that you can check. The, the link will be left in the, in the presentation. And it has to do with uh, processing the most innovative findings in papers. There are many papers produced every day, uh, only speaking about uh, genetics. Uh, we have several million of papers right now. Um, most of the uh, substantial information can be found in the abstract. So this work uh, what does is uh, make focus on the abstract and try to infer conclusions or useful relations from the abstracts of the papers. In this case, you can see the PFAPA, which is a quite common uh, syndrome in, uh, in kids, the periodic fever with aptos stomatitis, which has uh, sore throat, and fever and, and, and so on. And it is currently is not very, very well uh, explained in terms of uh, causes. So it could be an example of uh, what we can find in papers that could be nice to put on the desktop of the physician for his consideration. The, this work proposes a pipeline in which you can match uh, medical records that could be in Spanish, doesn't matter, and match them to this mini ontology. The mini ontology is what we created in order to gather all of the in relevant information that we could find in these papers. More specifically, this work was for genetic papers that, that could uh, be applied to any other areas within medicine. Papers come from PubMed abstracts in English, and we also use uh, lexical resources uh, like SNOMED CT, and we produce a, a graph uh, which holds the, the knowledge, the actual knowledge base. Just one graph, uh, as Hector already mentioned. But in this case, we need to uh, infer concepts and relations between concepts, okay? For example, concepts could be genes, proteins, phenotypes, substances, diseases. One uh, very important resource is SOMED CT, which is uh, a collection of terminologies for diseases, symptoms, and so on. And luckily, it's available in several languages. So you could use it in order to do some translation. If you are standing on this concept in Spanish, you could translate to English. It, actually, it's already done. So we will take uh, this terminology as the foundation of our knowledge base, and we will enrich this with new relations. And how do we find uh, those relations? Well, we will uh, process the text and uh, using uh, machine learning models, we will identify entities or concepts and, and using other machine learning techniques, we will find the relations with, uh, between concepts. This is uh, a uh, collection of uh, NLP tasks, which means that you, you need to leverel, leverage several techniques. Uh, particularly, th there is one called um, distance supervision. In distance supervision, 
you start from a, a ground truth, which has uh, things that we know are real relations. And from that, you try to infer new relations. That's the main idea behind it. So going back to our example of the PFAPA syndrome, we see that uh, we have uh, different types of uh, nodes as Hector showed within the graph, different types of nodes. The red ones are uh, diseases, the purple ones are proteins, and the pink are uh, phenotypes or symptoms. Okay. So we found in this case a, a relationship between this protein and uh, this disease. Why? Because we found it in this phrase. Okay. So this is the evidence that sustains this association relationship. Another example here. We present how we map the knowledge graph to the gray nodes, which in turn represent the medical record, which is written in, Sp in Spanish in, in our case. So we could explore the graph, we could uh, query the graph, or we could expose it for external applications, chatbots, and, and so on. And this is a quick example of how you could do it. For instance, you can. You can query for concepts. You can query for genes that cause glaucoma. This means you can query for relations between two types of concepts. And you can see we have answers that are backed by assertions that you can find uh, in these abstracts. And finally, uh, we can map this to a clinical record. The clinical record uh, is made of um, many concepts and relations. Uh, what we did for this work was just to link at the concept level in order to suggest to the physician which would be uh, the better findings or treatments, uh, novelty uh, treatments that could be found in the, in the papers. So that's it about this work. Thank you for uh, listening to us. And now it's time for Raffle. Yes. I mean, uh, actually, yes, if, uh, I would like to have some questions because uh, you made a lot of work and, and it was really interesting. I mean, you should have been busy in this, in this month. Uh, just of, uh, I feel understand because we touch a lot of, of topics. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think is, is being the, the, the biggest accomplishment above all of them? Because you touch a lot of things and uh, from LPL being able to index all this data, from being able to publish this report, to being able to understand how the track was going. I mean, there's many tasks, honestly, that's uh, being able to propagate the uncertainty on the results and the mapping graphs and so on. So you, you have been facing a lot of things here. And some, I think that's maybe, uh, it would be nice to understand also what you think you're more, more proud. I don't want you to pick up <laughs> maybe, but what do you think is uh, the greatest joy, uh, uh, achievement? I don't know if it makes sense, well, but. I'm not sure if I got the question right. I tried to answer. <laughs> Um, so, well, just yeah. to understand, because I mean, I can phrase it better. So, I, I think that's uh, there is a lot of things you presented, and I think it's really nice. And there is a lot of uh, fuel for thought for all of us. Uh, but it will also be nice uh, to understand how many, I'm say, the kind of time that you spend in all of this in terms mm -hmm. of uh, people, the, the faces, the complexity. So, sometimes I uh, think there was some complexity for engineering problems. So, Mm -hmm. like the pipeline for the putting the data from the data lakes was a little bit of engineering then we mm -hmm. discussed also the all the part of uh, mathematical so if you get uh, to some sort of thing to be sure that these numbers get propagated then also when we're talking about optimization again is a, a problem of modeling of course you no know, of the data then uh, running this execution 
We're talking about NLP is a problem of mapping the data. Yeah. And this is, of course, uh, providing and getting all this data. So what I'm really trying to, to guess that there is a lot of things here and there's a lot of uh, mathematical problems, engineering problems, yeah. and something in the middle. And it would like to nice to, to have, uh, but what was the, the biggest pain for you guys when you were developing all these great things? Okay. Uh, okay, I, I think I got it. Uh, yes, actually, uh, Cesare, this could be uh, this could be well three talks, not one, but uh, <laughs> we wanted to to show uh, our recent effort regarding the COVID, which was the, the main part of the of, of the talk, and that that was uh, a project that involved about uh, ten people or twelve people, I think, because we people were getting in and out, but. Uh, the other two, the other two talks, uh, we thought that uh, it was a good time to show also, also that, that that work. Uh, by far, the the most uh, stressful one was the first part, because it was something that was going on right now, and so many actors, so many sources, uh, you could not uh, make mistakes on crossing or matching information because uh, you were talking about the uh, people that were hospitalized, you were talking about deaths. So it was really, really information has to be checked three or four times with experts. So uh, yes, uh, I would say we had something like three months that we were uh, at the top with, with that uh, project. And the requirements were all urgent, uh, mm. and they came from the government, uh, so it was a plus to us, no? Mm. At, at the same no, time, no, no, it, it was yeah. it was a very rewarding because uh, you we were feeling that we were contributing to the solution. No, no, I think this is a, a very good response. This is uh, the timing and the pressure and also the, the relevance of what you were doing. So it is, uh, of course, was putting more pressure, but it was nice to see that you were able to achieve such a result. And um, yeah, I think that it was actually a very good response. Okay, thank you. I don't know if uh, there's a raffle now or... Okay. Uh, yes, if anyone has any other question, uh, then we can go to the raffle. I think Eve is gonna share her screen because she got the roulette with the names of the participants. Yeah, well, you can share it yourself, huh? I think. Okay. Okay, let me. Ah, you send me. Okay. And just in the meantime, we can just also recall that the bit that this uh, presentation has been recorded. So, yeah. so I guess that we can later share with the meetup the, the video. And so also we'll have opportunity to review the presentation and also text many more notes and all the papers and all the things that have been presenting. Okay, why is there is there is important they're missing names. Okay. Ah, shit. I didn't share this. Yeah, but I didn't share. Ah, okay. Perfect. You need to share? Yes. Just, just you can hear the applause. This was, this was the roulette going. I will so share many another people. screen. So, so, somebody won. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah, somebody won. We didn't know which one. Uh, let me just share the screen. And we can see more. I didn't see it. <laughs> okay. Matthew B. It's the first winner of uh, one IntelliJ uh, license 
uh, we're going to send you the link through the chat or um, or through the Spark Meetup group. Uh, we're going to contact you with this. And let's see. Another one. And Omar is the second one. <laughs> I love the applause. <laughs> We're really motivating. Yeah. Okay, the same uh, way we're gonna contact you with the um, with the link so you can uh, access to the to the license. Okay, just um yeah. I would just write just the, the two people that want, please don't leave the the, the mm -hmm. meetup so we can just get the, the contact and mm -hmm. we can send you by mail the, the price. And and for the rest, I guess it's everything, no, for this meetup for today. So again, thank you everybody for uh, participating. Again, uh, we're really looking forward for seeing all of you in person and yeah. being able to share a beer and in, uh, for real and not remotely and in the meantime let's hope this is the last christmas sets we have to spend <laughs> in this situation and uh, next time we don't have to talk about covid <laughs> or um, be influenced by covid but still it was a, a very nice presentation thank you all for coming and um, have a good have a good day yeah thank, thank you, you all hey thank Impressive you presentation huh? okay bye Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. You too. <laughs> you too.